Welcome back to the show. We are here with the one and only Andrew Yang. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I was just coming on how much of a startup vibe this is. It's I love it. I mean, people are quiet right now, but before people were sitting on the floors and it looks a little uncomfortable, but it's uh, it's definitely lively here. Well, this this campaign is very much a, a startup. Um, and as a serial entrepreneur, I have to admit it feels very familiar. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, what's it like? now transitioning from your entrepreneurship life into something that's completely different, right? You kind of have to watch what you say and there's a, there's a lot of publicity on you really. And what's that transition been like in terms of a mindset for you? Well, you know, uh, I've enjoyed it a great deal because what, what we're doing with this campaign is hopefully raising awareness to the fact that we are in the midst of the greatest technological and economic transition in human history where we're automating away millions of jobs right before our eyes and the opportunity to go to people and say look it's not your imagination but we really did automate away four million manufacturing jobs we're going to do the same thing to the truck drivers the retail workers the call center workers and on and on and the great thing is americans are waking up to this reality where now 70 percent of americans agree that we're going to eliminate many more jobs than we're going to create over the next 10 years uh, and so making that transition has actually been quite easy and painless because right now I'm just going around telling people the truth uh, and it's it's been incredible how receptive people have been to the fact that we need to make big changes. Right. And this isn't something that is relatively new that you've been talking about, saw TED Talk, where you've been talking about this for about five years now, possibly even longer. So this is just about time that you're really publicizing this. Well, you know, my thinking on this has evolved where I started an organization venture for America that I'm incredibly proud of. I mean, it, it trains hundreds of young entrepreneurs are around the country. And I know you were involved with a similar, similar organization. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, but I've realized that technology is outpacing our institutions and our ability to educate and train people where entrepreneurship is going to be great and we need much, much more of it. But the changes are much more extreme and they're coming much more quickly than I would have realized a few years ago. Mm. And I mean, I, and we'll definitely have a lot of time to get back into artificial, artificial intelligence and how that's going to impact the economy. But I do want to go back into your childhood and the book, The War on Normal People. You start out talking about how as someone that is a minority, you had a tough time and you faced bullying. This is something that I personally struggle with a lot. And, you know, I've been called everything, chain, gook, like everything you can imagine. Well, did you grow up in Vancouver? I thought there were a lot of Asians there. <laughs> I did, but I came from South Korea. So when I, when I didn't really know English even, this was something that I definitely struggled with. Um, and I actually lived in South America where like every couple of blocks, oh, you, hear, wow. you hear Chino, Chino, Chino. And uh, it's, it's real for a lot of people that are coming in. So I'm curious to know, um, and King Chi is someone, a mutual friend of ours that introduced us. And when he actually first brought up the fact that you're running for president, I was like, okay, like what's, what's his name? I look at him and he said, Andrew Yang. I was like, wait a minute, this guy's Asian? I've never heard of an Asian American trying to run for president. So are you actually the first person to run as an Asian American? Well, I'm the first Asian American man to run as a Democrat. Um, there was an Asian American peace candidate in the 70s, a congresswoman from Hawaii, and then Bobby Jindal ran as a South Asian mm. governor on the Republican side right. um, in 2012. But I, I am the first Asian American man to run for president as a Democrat. That's amazing. And this type of thinking is certainly what we need in the economy for sure. But I'd love to kind of deconstruct the the inner ambition that you had in order to kind of make these kind of decisions in your career. When you talk to any entrepreneur, they always have a chip on their shoulder, right? Yes. So talk to me a little bit about if you have any of those in your childhood or growing up and how that's impacted a lot of the decisions you make. Well, uh, I was one of the only Asian kids in my town in upstate New York. Uh, and certainly... You know, like my classmates reminded me <laughs> of the fact that I was one of the only Chinese or Asian kids around uh, very, very often. Yeah. And so when you're young, 
um, that's hard and you end up responding to it in different ways. So I, I definitely had a chip on my shoulder. I also skipped a grade, so I was smaller and younger and wimpier <laughs> than, than most of my classmates for a long time. Wow. Um, so those two things together uh, always made me feel like an underdog. Uh, and, uh, and I've always taken pride in trying to stick up for uh, the little guy or the underdog as a result. Hmm. And you know, now transitioning from, you decided to take a traditional career as a lawyer. Yes, uh, I was a lawyer for five months. And you quit for in five months, like right away? Well, uh, I had a, a few things I realized. One, that I didn't want to do this job forever. Mm -hmm. And two, that it was going to get harder to quit, not easier. So if those two things are true, then you should quit as soon as you can. And, right. and so I thought, okay, I should quit as soon as possible. So I quit um, after working as an attorney for five months. Mm -hmm. And I co-founded a dot-com that crashed and burned in the first dot-com bubble uh, in 2001. And that was star giving, I believe? Yes, yes. It was, okay. a, it was a very dot com 1.0 idea. It was a fundraising site for celebrity affiliated nonprofits. It was a hybrid of something called the Hunger Site uh, and then celebrity giving. Right now, there's a company that does something similar called omaze.com. Mm. So I was approximately 18 years uh, ahead of my time. Wow. So this is just like a timing, timing thing, like most companies. Yeah. Well, you know, my, many entrepreneurs will tell you that. Uh, that a lot of it's the team and the execution. So mm -hmm. even if the idea had been right, I'm not sure if my team was the right team at that point. I was quite young and uh, very raw. How old were you when you first started? Uh, I was 25 when I, I started Stargiving.com. I wow. had a co-founder who was a little bit older than me. Right, right. Um, and I know we're jumping around a little bit, but I remember reading that your dad had about 96 or 69 patents throughout his career. Yeah, he's, he's a, um, an engineer, a lab geek, uh, an inventor. I mean, like, what were all those patents on? A lot it's of them crazy. were related on how to make liquid crystal displays uh, smaller and flatter. Mm. So when he got started at GE in the 70s, no one wanted anything to do with liquid crystal displays. Like, it wasn't clear that there was any commercial potential there. Right. And so he took it, and then he ended up filing patent after patent on how to make them uh, more compact. Mm. Um, to a point when now obviously there are LCD screens everywhere and then the next generation on top of that. So he's been working in display technologies for, um, for decades since before it was cool. Wow. And were there any specific lessons that either your, uh, your mom or your dad has taught you that has impacted a lot of the decisions that you've made throughout your career? Well, part of the chip on your shoulder you're talking about was that, um, my, my parents gave me a couple lessons. One, you do not want your career to depend upon whether the person uh, above you likes you. Like that, that's mm. like a bad place to be. <laughs> right. Um, and that, that was something that my dad pushed us. The second thing was that if someone else can do it, you can do it too. And so one of the reasons I became an entrepreneur was I met other entrepreneurs and I said, okay, well, if you're capable of this, then I'm capable of it too. Uh, so then I, I tried and it turns out it was very hard and you know, <laughs> the, 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 my first company um, did not work out. Right. But then like you, and I know you've had this experience where you, you get exposure and then you want to do it again and then you get stronger, you develop. So the way that I developed and the way I think other people should develop is by going to work in a strong team, mm. um, which is what my organization Venture for America helps young aspiring entrepreneurs do. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely love to talk more about that. We were just talking about Reza, who often says when he went from Canada and he started attending Harvard, there's this perception that you want to put a lot of these people on the pedestal, that they're a lot smarter than you, that they have a lot more experience. And something interesting that he mentioned was like, they're just like you. And if you work hard enough and you, you can focus and strategically make decisions that are going to be better for your career, you can ultimately overcome a lot of these things that, uh, you know, that most people think is above their pay grade. Um, and this is kind of the opportunity that you're giving with Venture for America. So talk to us a little bit about uh, VFA and what your mission is with the organization. So it was 2009 and my, my education company was acquired by the Washington Post. And yeah. so I personally taught the analyst classes at Goldman Sachs and McKinsey. And I saw there were so many smart recent graduates who were doing jobs that they didn't really enjoy and they weren't sure why they were there. And then they were 
hitting the reset button by going to business school and doing it all over again. And I thought, like, wow, we really need to improve on this somehow for the sake of everybody because having all of your brain power doing the same stuff over and over again is not good for the economy or society. So I started a nonprofit in 2011, Venture for America, to help connect recent graduates with startups and early stage companies in Detroit, Cleveland, St. Louis, Baltimore, Cincinnati, and other cities around the country that could use the talent to grow these businesses uh, and also weren't getting a lot of talent uh, naturally. So that that's what I've been doing from, well, that's what I did from 2011 to last year was help build Venture for America. Right. Uh, and again, incredibly proud of everything that Venture for America continues to do. Um, we've now helped recruit and train over a thousand entrepreneurs and they've gone on to create thousands of jobs. Uh, it's awesome work. So you started this right after you sold your first company to Kaplan? Well, technically it was uh, it was my third or fourth company, but it was the first company that worked out. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so we won't <laughs> yeah. we talk about the other ones too yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I want to make clear that you know I, I had a few uh, bumps and bruises. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, amongst everyone. Um, and is there like a specific lesson that you're trying to teach the entrepreneurs that perhaps the uh, people that are listening, the aspiring entrepreneurs, can really take away that you know if they weren't if they didn't have the opportunity to participate in something like Venture for America, that they can still do this everywhere across the world? Well, sure. Uh, so what we did with Venture for America is we we put people in a small team environment, and then we pushed an action orientation and execution with resources that are available to you because some of the traps that you get into as an entrepreneur is you always think, oh, if I get more connections, money, <laughs> resources, then I can do the thing. And most of the time you can do a, a, a whole heck of a lot uh, to lead up to that point. And then as you do more then the resources come your way. So uh, one of the things that I'd certainly impart to anyone who's uh, seeing this or hearing this is that, that you can always get a lot more done than you think you can, and then the resources come to you as opposed to always thinking you need the resources before you take the next series of steps. And is there a system or a process that Venture for America kind of instills in the entrepreneurs that allows them to get to that stage that perhaps the creative or the entrepreneur that's hustling out there can at least shortcut their path into getting that C stage or the partner that they need? So Venture for America, we train people for a number of weeks, but then the, the next thing we do is we put them in an early stage company for two years so they can mm -hmm. learn and grow and develop. And that's what I'd advise most entrepreneurs or people who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs to do is go find a team and develop within that team because the founder role is something that you, you develop a certain set of muscles, but you can put yourself in a position where you're not learning quite as much uh, right. Whereas if you're part of a team, you're almost guaranteed a certain body of learning. So with Venture for America, we put them in position to learn. And then if they want to start their own business, we have a small seed fund and a little accelerator to help them. So we, we kind of put stones in the river, so to speak, and then ask them to, to take each step. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's not a company, it's not necessarily a company building process, the core foundation. It's more trying to get the people to like an apprenticeship almost. Yeah, it's very much as an apprenticeship them. because that's the way I learned. I worked for a more experienced entrepreneur for a number of years mm. before I, I became the CEO of another company. And that's the way most people develop. Was there a particular CEO or a mentor that you had while you were, uh, I guess, in, in Manhattan? Well, the founder of the company, Zeke Vanderhoek, was someone I learned an immense amount from. He's like mm. a capital E educator. And I did not fancy myself a capital E educator <laughs> at that point. I was more like a lowercase b business person. Sure. So I learned a ton from him about the core values of running an education company. And from the CEO before him, Manu Kapoor was a world-class team builder and salesperson. And uh, I learned a ton from watching him work. So what happens over time, and you've probably had this experience, is that you end up with a series of voices in your head uh, from mm. the bosses that you've had. And if those bosses happen to be entrepreneurs, then you develop in that direction. Right. And is there a particular lesson that's, that you can recall that's really influenced you in the way you're making decisions even up to this date? You know, running a, an education company was perfect training for much of what has come later, yeah. where you get pulled in a couple of different directions. But most of the time, if you do the right thing by the student or the customer, then that's the best thing for the business. And that 
is something I try and remember every day in any context where if you try and do the right thing for the person you're trying to serve, mm. then the rest tends to get much better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm actually in the education business as well with my company, Ripe, and it is hard, certainly, to motivate a lot of the people to, to, to learn. It's kind of an uphill battle. It's kind of like health and fitness. Were there particular things that you guys did in the company to, I guess, internally motivate a lot of the students or clients that you guys had? Well, they were pretty self-motivated, which might be different from your student base because they were right. spending uh, they hundreds were spending of dollars money, right, on right. this expensive course and these, like, you know, nice books and <laughs> all this other, um, all this other nice set of materials. Experience. So yeah. happily, motivation wasn't our challenge, mm -hmm. and um, and people took it seriously. So there, there were a lot of pluses to the consumer base that we were serving. Gotcha, gotcha. So what were some of the challenges that you guys faced as you were building the company? And do you recall some of the discussions that you've had that uh, you guys took to resolve it? Well, the main way we grew was by trying to find the very best instructors in the country where we were paying four times the market rate. Uh, we were paying 100 bucks an hour and the national companies were paying about 25. Right. And so we required a 99th percentile score and teaching experience. And the real pain point for us was trying to find someone we thought was awesome enough. And sometimes when we couldn't, then we just like wouldn't expand to a city. I looked for someone mm -hmm. in Miami as an example like four years and then our competitors were like making money in Miami and we were just there like being like why can't we find our person in Miami and then whenever we bring someone in from Miami we'd be like please let them be good <laughs> and then when someone was close to the line yeah you wanted to talk yourself into hiring that person real bad um, you're so desperate right you're, yeah you're it's like you're freaking someone. leaving money on the table yeah, it's like let's yeah. freaking like get there uh, but then you'd have to say to yourself like am I like compromising and quality in some way. And so there were so many people that came that were like right below the line and it was agonizing. And I, I was, you know, the CEO. And so I was always trying to build the business and do what's best for the business, but then was making that compromise. Was that, mm -hmm. that going to be good for the business over the long haul? So what we ended up doing, oh my gosh, it was so expensive. <laughs> Where Like I had this nighttime conversation with this New York instructor, Dimitri. And then he was like, oh, I'd like to live in Miami for a while. I was like, dude, if you move to Miami, I will like pay you this and oh, that. Man. And we just had to like live in Miami, like at the company dime for like a year oh, uh, to, to try and just to get this, just to get the instructors going, just trying to get the, the business going down there and then hopefully like find an instructor candidates. Um, so we, end, and, but it, it ended up, we ended up getting lucky at, at the end of his time there and then the right person came along. So he spent like a whole year just living, living the life in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> Is he still there? I don't know. I should look it up. Uh, you know, Dimitri owes me a very pleasant year of his no life. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so you had this, uh, I guess, challenging but amazing experience where you're now into politics, as I mentioned in the beginning of the interview. It's a completely different field. But going back to this question of you really being one of the few Asian Americans to run for president, why do you think there's such a low representative of other minorities or other Asian Americans that are trying to be this ambitious and trying to really put themselves in the spotlight? Well, my parents immigrated here from Taiwan in the uh, 60s and 70s, and their message to me and my brother was very much just to try and do well. And so do, doing well for most immigrant families, I think, means get a good education, get a good job. Right. And something like politics or public service is generally not on that list. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my parents were not that pumped when I told them I was heading this direction, as an example, though now they've gotten very excited. <laughs> uh, and so I, I think that very few Asian Americans or people from immigrant communities uh, are in position to be able to think on a societal level and try and do something very positive for uh, the country as a whole as opposed to their own families because mm -hmm. many of them are in a position where they have to provide for their families week to week or month to month really right so you think a lot a lot of it is the influence amongst parents that are directing a lot of what their children are doing yeah you get a lot of messages and and it's uh very practical i'd say that most immigrant families myself and my, my own family included just very very practical yeah same and, with mine yeah and politics is quite impractical 
uh, for many, many people. Yeah. Though in my case, I would say that to me, the economic transition that we're going through is going to make it so that I'm not excited to bring my two little boys up in this country unless we get our arms around it and fix it. Yeah. Because the automation of manufacturing jobs led to Donald Trump as president because we automated away these jobs in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, the swing states he needed to win. Mm. And so as we triple down on that, as my friends in Silicon Valley begin to automate truck driving and retail and all these other things, yeah. it's just going to get worse and worse. So I would argue that it's actually a very practical decision mm to run for president if you think that uh, that's necessary for us to preserve the integrity of, of our society. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, this is just a personal question for me, is um, this is your way of really getting this into the spotlight, which is the threats of AI and how that could impact the economy and jobs and a lot of people's lives. Yes. But I'm, I'm curious to know, it was. I'm trying to think, was there, was this really the central way of getting that message out? Because I know you produced documentary to spread the message of entrepreneurship. Couldn't you technically have done something similar that doesn't put you in so much pressure and I guess in the spotlight, it's a very difficult decision to run for president. Yeah, it's possible. And what's funny is I actually just came from a meeting where we're talking about a documentary about automation. Sort of an inconvenient okay, so truth well. about that. Yeah, I'll yeah. do that too. Yeah. Uh, we need to do everything we can. Sure, sure. Uh, but I would go on a limb and say that uh, running for president is the most effective way to both get the message out there and also start to implement and enact real solutions. Mm -hmm. Because if you buy, which many, many people do, they, they buy the fact that automation is coming and it's already tearing giant holes in the labor market. Right. But then where people struggle is, okay, what do we do about that? Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm advocating is the freedom dividend, which is a universal basic income of $1,000 per adult per month. Uh, this would help Americans go back to school, move for new opportunities, start a new business, pay their bills, and generally just stay functional, keep their head up, and adapt to the new economy. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm very, very certain that that is exactly what we should do, and I outlined some of that in my book. Yeah. Um, but most people are still struggling with what a meaningful solution to automation would be. And so I think that my campaign can double as both a way for uh, people to discover that this issue is very real and very pressing, and also to consider what the next move should be and what the solution should be. Can you talk to me a, a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence in general? Because I'm, I'm trying to think of the crowd. I think a lot of people that are listening to this understand the basics of AI, but I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't really even know what AI is, artificial intelligence. It's kind of something like a robot or like a, it's like one of those spaceships that you go on. Sure. But it's it's a real thing and it's more than ever, it's being talked about with shows like Black Mirror that's coming out, there's Westworld. Like, <laughs> what is the reason that is there's so much attention on artificial intelligence when really the technology has been around for about 20 years, right? It's really been talked about for a while. Well, uh, the truth is that AI does not need to be that genuinely intelligent in order to threaten the livelihoods of many, many Americans. Where, as an example, there are two and a half million call center workers in the United States. Now, do you need genuine AI to outperform the average call center worker? Probably not. <laughs> you just need like a really convincing uh, software mm. bot or script, and Google essentially uh, is already there. Yeah. Uh, and so the AI discussion has a number of components but what I'm focused on is what Americans actually do for a living right now. And the top five job categories in the United States are clerical work, including call centers, sales and retail, food service and food prep, truck driving, and manufacturing. So you don't need intelligent AI, what's called the, like general intelligence AI, to outperform call center workers, Retail, 10% of Americans work in retail, and 30% of malls are going to close in the next four years. And again, right. that's not AI. That's just commerce moving to Amazon. Sure. Uh, fast food, food service, and food prep, a lot of that front of house stuff is getting automated away. Truck driving. Truck driving is the most common job in 29 states. There are 3.5 million of them, 94% male, average age 49. So, uh, you know, you don't really think of AI as necessary for automating uh, truck driving or taxi driving, but that is a form of AI. So, sure. so those are the issues to me that we should be focused on. 
and then when you get into the speculative, the true general intelligence AI, then all bets are off. <laughs> right, right. That's that's even controllable. Um, yes. So we're going to have massive problems before we get there, and that's true by the numbers right now. If you look at the numbers right now, the U.S.'s labor force participation rate is down to sixty-two point nine percent, which is the same level as El Salvador and the Dominican Republic, wow. because of the automation of manufacturing workers. Those manufacturing workers did not find new jobs. They left the workforce and they went on disability. Mm -hmm. And many of them started killing themselves, which is why our life expectancy has declined for the last two years. Uh, the, again, the numbers are very stark and they're very real, but they tell a clear picture as to what will happen to the next groups of workers that lose their jobs due to automation. And when do you think this will really take a major force in terms of impacting the jobs in America or just around the world? Well, uh, again, we're in the midst of it. We're in like the third or fourth inning. And mm -hmm. when I was doing research for my book, that's really what I uncovered that shocked me, which is this is no longer speculative. This is like inning number three. And so some of the segments I focus on really are, if you just say freight, retail, call centers, in total, that's enough to push us into uh, record levels of dysfunction and disability. I mean, th those three categories alone um, employ over 10 million Americans. Wow, that's insane. And that already, we're talking about Google already having better technology to be able to yes. replace those people. That's crazy. Um, yeah, that's why I'm running for president, man. I mean, <laughs> we, we live in, we, we live in uh, genuinely uh, dangerous times yeah. where things that we imagine as distant future or science fiction are here with us it's today. Coming. Yeah, yeah, it's right now. And I think, um, I think it's Ray Kurzweil and a lot of futurists that are talking about the exponential increase of how fast the technology is evolving. So even though we're at third inning right now, the exponential curve of it is, it's, it could be a lot faster in the next five years. We don't know where, how fast the technology is going to be improved. Yeah, my friends in Silicon Valley are getting increasingly confident about AI. Uh, there's a saying out there that AI is the new electricity. And they're going to be able to do things with AI that right now take departments of hundreds or even thousands of humans. Right. So some people that are watching this may argue that we've kind of gone through a similar transition, obviously not as big, where, yeah, there was a lot of farmers back in 1950s, yes. 1940s, and through the Industrial Revolution, but people ended up automating a lot of the things that farmers are doing, but now we have new jobs. So a lot of people are arguing about the same Thing with AI is, you know, I think there's like 1.8 million jobs that are going to be uh, taken, but it's going to be replaced with 2.3 million jobs. So is that something, and obviously people have different opinions, but sure. what are your thoughts on that for people that are trying to make that argument on the other side? You know, I have to say it's a bad sign when someone has to re reach back 120 years and say, oh, <laughs> like, you know, factories, like industrial revolution. Where if you look at the numbers, according to Bain, the labor absorption rate during this period is going to have to be four times higher than the Industrial Revolution. Mm. And during the Industrial Revolution, there was actually massive unrest. <laughs> like Labor Day was inaugurated in response to a series of riots that killed dozens of people and caused billions of dollars worth of damage. Labor unions arose in 1886 because of the working conditions, and they fought for 40-hour work weeks and no child labor and overtime, all of this stuff. So even if you were to, to use history as a reference point, you would expect really tough times. Yeah. But then by the numbers, this is going to impact a larger number of people at a faster rate than anything we have seen before. And that's not me talking. Yeah. That's McKinsey, Bain, MIT, all have drawn the same conclusions. And if we had a functional government, they would say, hey, this is a society-wide problem we need to get our arms around. But because our government is this backwards uh, mess, then uh, we're paying attention to cultural food fights mm. instead of the technological and economic issues that are truly driving the problems. Sure. And let's say this is inevitable, this is going to happen in the next five to 10 years. What is the solution? You're saying it's the freedom dividend where you're providing universal basic income, everyone gets $1,000 a month. Does this include people like entrepreneurs or CEOs that are making millions of dollars? Sure. How do you divide that and how do you allocate it so that it's fair and people that really need the money are, are getting it? And how do you allocate that? Well, I've got three big steps that we need to take. So the first is this freedom dividend, which is not means tested. You get it. I get it. Um, the single mom gets it. Like everyone gets it. Okay. 
Uh, and then the second thing is we need to ha implement new measuring sticks for the economy because relying on GDP and stock market growth and profit growth uh, are going to end up leading us in the wrong directions over time. Our GDP is going to go up and up, but more and more people are going to be left behind. Right. So we need new measurements that actually speak to how we're doing as a people, like childhood success rates or levels of engagement with work or mental health and freedom from substance abuse, environmental quality, arts and creativity, all things that we value that uh, we can directly measure instead of relying upon GDP to, to tell us how we're doing. We made up GDP less than 100 years ago during the Great Depression, uh, and even its creator said, hey, this is not <laughs> a perfect measurement, right. and now we rely upon it way too much. Uh, the third thing is we need to implement a new digital social currency that maps to pro-social behaviors and activities that we value, like taking care of the elderly, nurturing your children, volunteering in the community, uh, journalism, doing things that are valuable, because more and more people are going to be pushed into, uh, uh, into a situation where they're going to need more means to structure and organize their time. I'm very pro-work. Uh, I'm an Asian guy. So this, there, there's no... You're about to hustle, right? Well, yeah, it's yeah. just you, you need... <laughs> like, the, the facts are clear that without work, uh, people suffer. So we need to create new forms of work mm. that more Americans can access independent of their skill level because everyone has something that they can offer at the most basic human level. And that's what we need to reward uh, and create a new parallel economy around using a new currency that I would call the digital social credit. Sure. So all of this is to evolve to the next stage of capitalism, which I call human-centered capitalism or human capitalism, because the capital markets will value human qualities and human labor less and less over time. And so we need to transition to a new set of measurements if we are going to flourish and prosper hmm. in the years ahead. Yeah, and this idea of universal basic income is not... It's been introduced. I think Martin Luther King was talking yes. about it back, you know, back in his day. And you know, obviously now you have Zuckerberg is also promoting it as well. And I'm glad someone like yourself is really putting this into into the spotlight. Um, I did want to ask you, which is the question that everyone asks, which is how you how you end up paying for it. Sure. Um, I think there's a lot more information that people can look up. But if you want to just kind of quickly go over, because I know people are going to be asking, how do you pay a thousand dollars a month to 400 million people in the U.S. Yeah, there aren't that many of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you can go through uh, the math on my website, yang2020.com. Yeah. Uh, but the, the big picture is that we need to implement a value-added tax, which is something that every society except for the U.S. Yeah, Canada uh, every, has it. Yeah, every yeah, industrialized yeah. country has it because it's yeah, really yeah. effective. And income taxes are worse and worse at generating revenue if more and more work is done by software and AI and robots. So we need to shift to a value-added tax, which will harvest that revenue and allow us to, to make big changes. If we implement a value-added tax at half the European level, it would generate between seven and $800 billion in revenue. And our economy right now is up to $19 trillion. It's grown by $4 trillion in the last 10 years. We can easily afford this. So if that gets you the first seven to $800 billion, we spend another $500 billion currently on income support that uh, that's redundant. And so... At this point, you're about two-thirds of the way there. And the greatest part that all entrepreneurs are going to love is that the Roosevelt Institute tried to measure the impact of giving you, me, and everyone else in America $1,000 a month. Huh. And not surprisingly, they, they found it would grow the economy by 13% or $2.5 trillion, And it would create 4.5 million new jobs in perpetuity. So for all of that economic growth, we get 25% back in revenue. And then we send, end up saving billions on things like incarceration and homelessness service and health care right. because people that are getting $1,000 a month are less likely to turn up in the ER as their primary care in a way that we all end up paying for anyway. Sure. So universal basic income would end up paying for itself in so many ways. Uh, there was one study that showed that money spent on poverty ends up uh, being multiplied 7x throughout the economy. And that's the kind of thing that we can see happen in communities around the country. Alaska has had a small universal basic income for 36 years, wow. implemented by a Republican governor, the petroleum dividend. And now it's wildly popular. It's created thousands of jobs. It's reduced uh, infant health problems. It's, you know, again, deep red state, 36 years old, wildly popular. Yeah. There's no reason why we can't bring that to the other 49 states that are a little warmer and more pleasant than Alaska. 
definitely, definitely more pleasant. <laughs> no offense to Alaska. No offense to Alaska. But it's you're. Like, it's like a change to the heads up. Okay. So it's like oh, right, right. Okay. Yeah. No offense to Alaska, but <laughs> it's cold there and dark. Um, <laughs> so, and this is just like a practical question, but you're giving someone. I'm probably a, not going to win in Alaska anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> We can cut that part out. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's funny. Um, so, I mean, the, the thing is, like, you, you're giving someone $1,000 a month. And I've been in situations where, and this includes people that are homeless, I'm assuming, right? People that are really struggling out there. Well, you need a bank account. You need a means to get the money. Right. Okay. I guess the question is, I've given homeless people $5, $10 here and there, or just giving them food. But how do I know that they're not going to the back corner and buy more heroin? Well, happily, the numbers are very, very optimistic when you look at the studies of what people do when they're getting income support. So work levels stay constant except for two groups, teenagers who graduate from high school at higher levels and new moms who spend more time with their kids. Hmm. But substance abuse does not go up. Mental health improves. Domestic violence goes down. Hospital visits go down. Uh, it, it's, it's very, very positive on many, many dimensions. There, of course, will be some Americans who are uh, having problems with substance abuse that might end up using the, um, the, the money on their habit, but other Americans will seek treatment. And the, 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 the studies are clear that there is not a rampant increase in substance abuse with right. people receiving uh, this sort of income support. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the positives, I guess you're saying the positives will outweigh the people, the few people that may try to abuse the system. Essentially. Yeah, and if you think about it, it's not like a lack of money is keeping people from uh, doing drugs now. I mean, right. uh, seven Americans are dying of opiates every hour right now. Wow. And so it's not like somehow they're not finding the money to, to get drugs. Gotcha. So to, to close up, I have a few, few just closing questions. Um, I guess one around AI and how massive this is going to be for the people that are listening to this, millennials, high school graduates, even college graduates, if you were to advise your two children, now you have two children, yeah. how to prepare for this new economy where everything's going to be automated? Number one, what are the skill sets that are going to be most vital that people should be really investing in Yes, that may not be important now, or it is still important now, but it's going to be way more important in the future? Sure. So if you look at the jobs that are most subject to automation, it's not low education, high education. It's repetitive versus non-repetitive. So if you do a repetitive intellectual job, like accounting or bookkeeping or a lot of lawyering, uh, then you're, you could be in trouble. Mm. Uh, if you do non-repetitive manual work, like cutting hair or cleaning hotel rooms <laughs> or, or landscaping, you're probably not going to be automated because you can imagine yeah. trying to get some like hairdressing room. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, and never getting a robot to cut the hair. <laughs> so, so the key for a young person is to head towards non-routine uh, tasks and environments and mm -hmm. have a few traits that, that are core to your uh, professional life. One is adaptability because things are going to change. So if you think, oh, if I can just do this one thing, it's going to work out, that's probably not the case. You have to right. keep moving. Right. The, the second is teamwork because a lot of the social elements are going to be the most difficult to automate. Uh, and then the third is resilience where there's going to be some difficulty in a lot of the most important work and you want to be the sort of person who can do that stuff and then just keep smiling and, and <laughs> make it seem like uh but you know like it's no problem at all so mm. again that's a adaptive ability uh resilience and teamwork gotcha gotcha so really, a lot of entrepreneurial stuff really sure. pretty much like creativity like everyone's going to have to become more entrepreneurial because the stable and secure jobs are not going to be there gotcha that's good to hear, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for us, for everyone listening to this, that's good. Yes. But I, I literally have friends who are raising tens of millions of dollars to automate legal work. And if you look at the law school graduate underemployment and unemployment rates, I mean, they're just going up and up. So there, it, the answer is not more school, mm. more training, more education. The, the answer is really uh, developing your own personal capacities and your ability to contribute in a wide range of environments. Gotcha. So rapid fire questions. Favorite book that you've gifted to someone else? East of Eden. I just like John Steinbeck and Stories of America from that era. Gosh, I haven't actually. Is it like a fiction book? It is fiction. It's a great work of American literature, man. <laughs> <laughs> I only know Canadian, sorry. <laughs> gotcha. 
Um, and then what's a piece of wisdom? Now that, I tend to give a lot of people my book. To your book, yes. Yeah. To world, I've given people. a lot of gifts. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's a piece of wisdom that you've learned throughout your career that you really could have used in your 20s? You know, I wish I'd had a little more uh, self-love <laughs> or like self-compassion because when things weren't going right, I was always really uh, beating myself up and being like, oh man, like, you know. Um, and now looking back, if I could just go back to my younger self and say, everything's going to be all right. And, like things are going to work out okay. And, you know, like you're going to uh, like get married and have kids and run for president. <laughs> like that, that'd be great to be able to share yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think I should have enjoyed the journey a little bit more when I was a bit younger. Hmm. Were you always like a workaholic, kind of always, always on? Well, I just had a, I had a bunch of goals that I took a little bit too seriously, and that I was always uh, thinking, how can I make progress towards certain goals? And some of those goals were personal things like own a dog or whatnot, you know? Sure. Um, so it's not like I was just like, oh, ooh, I have to like I maximize really need this dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but. Uh, I, I certainly could have enjoyed the ride a little bit more. Yeah, that's actually a common thing that I hear all the time from really successful people is just to like breathe, like relax. So everything's going to be okay at the end of the day. Yeah, everything is going to be okay. And uh, particularly on a personal front where now, you know, I met my wife when I was 31 and uh, now we've got two beautiful kids. And um, yeah, and, and that was like a source of real pressure and anxiety uh, before, but now you know, looking back on the women that I was like trying to make things work with in contrast to my wife, it was like, sure. oh man, <laughs> like, I should have just waited for her. Oh yeah. Yeah. So last question, you have a chance to choose a running mate. You've got Elon Musk, The Rock, or Oprah. Who do you choose and why? You know, it's definitely going to be either The Rock or Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think Elon Musk would be a good guy? <laughs> no, because I think he and I have some similar brain wiring. Uh, and so when you're trying to build a team, you don't want two of the same dude. <laughs> Not to yes. flatter myself and say I'm just like Elon, but, no, no, but sure, having read, sure. read a lot of his stuff, like uh, I think he and I are wired in some similar ways. So I would need yeah. someone that uh, had strengths that I do not have, and certainly both The Rock and Oprah have strengths I do not have. You, you, have, to you have to choose one, though. Which one would you think? You know, uh, if I had to choose one, I would say The Rock, just because I was a big Rock fan and WWE fan. Yeah, and I feel like I just know him better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as a result. and you don't need to hire bodyguards, so <laughs> yeah, all the expenses. Yeah. Whereas with Oprah, I have a feeling the two of us would probably need some bodyguards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much. Uh, closing thoughts. Any anything that you want to share with the audience? Any closing uh, wisdom? And yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, I just want to say that if you are concerned about the impact of technology on the workforce, please do go to yang2020.com, join our campaign, and let's build a new kind of economy that puts humanity first again, because it's not going to happen without you, me, and other Americans making it real together. So thank you very much for this opportunity, Sean. Yeah, this is amazing. And for everyone that's interested, that kind of wants to dig deeper into AI, I would highly recommend The War on Normal People. This is a book that I've read personally back to back to prepare for this and oh, it was thanks, man. really fascinating and also to check out the startup generation which features venture for america and andrew's work that he's done there so thanks so much thank you john thanks a lot guys for tuning in